book of Lamentations. It's a unique book in the Old Testament that contains five poems from an anonymous author who survived and is now reflecting back on the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem and the destruction and the exile that followed. Remember the whole story from the book of Second Kings. The fall of Jerusalem and the exile was the most horrendous catastrophe in Israel's history up to this point. So remember, God had promised Abraham the land. He'd given David victory to make Jerusalem Israel's capital. And from David came the royal line of kings. You had God's presence there in the temple, and that's where the priests maintained the rituals of Israel's worship. And after 500 years of all of this history, in the summer of 587 BC, the city fell to Babylon. It was all decimated and gone. And so the book of Lamentations is a memorial to the pain and confusion of the Israelites that followed this destruction. Now, the lament poems found here are not unique in the Bible. There's lots of them in the book of Psalms. And these biblical poems of lament, they do a number of things. They're a form of protest. They're a way of drawing everybody's attention, including God's attention, to the horrible things that happen in this world that should not be tolerated. They're a way of processing emotion. So in these poems, God's people vent their anger and dismay at the ruin caused by people's sin and selfishness. And these poems are a place to voice confusion. Suffering makes us ask questions about God's character and promises, and none of this is looked down on in the Bible. Just the opposite. These poems of lament give a sacred dignity to human suffering. And so these human words of grief that are addressed to God have now become part of God's word to his people. The design of these five poems is very intentional. It's part of the book's message. So chapters one through four are called acrostics, which means alphabet poems. Each poetic verse begins with a new letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is made up of 22 letters. Now this very ordered and linear structure, it's in stark contrast to the disorder of the pain and the confused grief that's explored in these poems. So it's like Israel's suffering is explored A to Z and is trying to express something that is inexpressible. Chapters one and two each have one verse per letter, giving them a really similar design, but the themes are very different. So chapter one focuses on the grief and shame of a figure called Lady Zion. The poet personifies the city of Jerusalem as a widow, also called the daughter of Zion. And she sits alone. She's bereaved of her loved ones, devastated. No one comes to comfort her. It's a very powerful metaphor. And then Lady Zion speaks. She calls on the Lord to notice her fate. And through this image, the poet, he's showing that the city's destruction brought a level of psychological trauma on the Israelites that can only be expressed as the experience of a funeral and the death of a loved one. Chapter 2 focuses on the fall of Jerusalem and how it was a consequence of Israel's sin and was brought about by God's wrath, which is a key word in this poem. Now, it's important to remember that in the Bible, God's wrath is not spontaneous, volatile anger. The biblical poets and prophets, they use this word to talk about God's justice. So Israel had entered a covenant agreement with God, and for centuries they've been violating it by worshiping other gods, perpetrating injustice, oppressing the poor. And so, yes, God is slow to anger, but he eventually does get angry at human evil, and he will bring his just anger in the form of punishment. In the case of Jerusalem, this involved allowing Babylon to come and conquer the city. And so this poem is acknowledging that God's wrath is justified, but this doesn't keep the poet from lamenting and asking God to show compassion once again. Chapter 3 breaks this design pattern by having three verses per letter, so it's the longest poem in the book. And the voice is that of a lonely man speaking out of his suffering and grief as a representative of the whole people. And what's interesting is that this chapter is full of language that's drawn from other parts parts of the Old Testament, from the laments of Job and from other important lament psalms and even from the suffering servant poems in Isaiah. And the poet sees his hardship as a form of God's justice, like chapter 2 said. But paradoxically, this is what gives the poet hope. And it leads him to offer the only hopeful words in the whole book. Because of the Lord's covenant faithfulness, we do not perish. His mercies never fail. They're new every morning. How great is your faithfulness, O God. So I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will put my hope in him. So the poet reasons, if God is consistent enough to bring his justice on human evil, then he'll also be consistent with his covenant promise to not allow evil to get the final word. And so for this poet, God's judgment is the seedbed of hope for the future.
Chapter 4 goes back to the same alphabet structure as chapters 1 and 2, and is a vivid and disturbing depiction of the two-year siege in Jerusalem. And it contrasts how things used to be in Jerusalem of the past and how terrible they became in the siege. So children used to laugh and play in the streets, but now they beg for food. The wealthy used to eat lavish meals, but now they eat whatever they can find in the dirt. And the royal leaders used to be full of splendor, but now they're famished and dirty and unrecognizable. And the anointed king from the line of David has been captured and dragged away. So the poem's power comes from the shock of these contrasts, and it's exploring the depth of the suffering that Israel brought on itself. Now, the final poem is unique because it breaks the design pattern. It's the same length as all of the other alphabet poems, but the alphabet order is gone. It's like the poet can't hold it together anymore and his grief has exploded back into chaos. The poem is a communal prayer for God's mercy. Israel begs God not to ignore their suffering or abandon them. And the poem offers a long list of all of the different kinds of people who were devastated by the fall of the city. They ask God not to forget these people, and they lament on behalf of others, giving voice to their pain. Suffering in silence is just not a virtue in this book. God's people are not asked to deny their emotions, but voice their protest to vent their feelings and pour it all out before God. The book ends with something of a paradox. The poet acknowledges that God is the eternal king of the world, but also that Israel's circumstances make them feel like God is nowhere to be found. And so the final words of the book leave this tension totally unresolved. It asks, unless you've totally rejected us, and the book ends. The poet doesn't offer a nice, neat conclusion, much like our own experiences of pain and suffering. The story of the Bible doesn't end here, but this very important book shows us how lament and prayer and grief are a crucial part of the journey of faith of God's people in a broken world. And that's what the book of Lamentations is all about. Well, as Jeff said at the top of the service, uh, we are going through the Bible chronologically, Genesis through Revelation, and I know many of you are caught up in your readings. And uh, we're still in the Old Testament. We have just a few more weeks to go, but we just keep going and going and going. We're calling this sermon series uh, the Holy Bible at 35,000 feet because that is the the altitude at which aircraft fly. And uh, if you've been on an airplane, most of us have. You look out the window and you look down and you see these, uh, you know, everybody sees something different. And in the same way, we're, we're all kind of, we're doing a flyover of the Bible. We're not going into detail uh, in the Bible, but really it's about Genesis through Revelation chronologically, and we're all seeing different things. And it's been really fun to hear your stories as I get to share many weeks uh, about the things I'm seeing in Scripture. And so this week, as we look down from 35,000 feet, uh, we are in the book of Lamentations. Who is excited for the book of Lamentations, right? Uh, if you've got your Bibles, we are in Lamenta- Lamentations 1 on, a pa- on page 1156. 1,156. We are cruising through the Bible, uh, and we're getting there. Last summer, as uh, most of you know, uh, I was on sabbatical with my family, and part of our journey around Europe looking at reform movements is we spent about a week in Rome, Italy. And uh, one of the days that we were in Rome, uh, we walked across town uh, to um, uh, the Vatican and over to St. Peter's Cathedral. And if you've ever been to St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, it is massive. In fact, it's known as the largest church in the world. Uh, It is absolutely massive. And before you get to St. Peter's Cathedral, uh, as you're walking closer and closer to it, you kind of hear a buzz in the air. You hear all sorts of people talking, and people are getting excited to go. And just outside of St. Peter's Cathedral is St. Peter's Square, which holds, can hold up to 800,000 people. And so as we're getting closer and closer, we're looking up ahead, and we can see 
thousands, if not tens of thousands of people descending on St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, Italy. And there's this, you know, people everywhere and there's long, long lines. In fact, I read that it takes a, uh, the average wait time to get into St. Peter's Cathedral is about two hours. Um, our daughter is in a wheelchair, so we went right to the front of the line, uh, which was awesome. But once you get inside, there are just more people everywhere. And it's filled with statues. It was designed, the dome was designed by Michelangelo. I mean, it is art upon art. Uh, it is massive, and uh, it's, it's beautiful, and it's, it's opulent. And after we left uh, St. Peter's Cathedral, uh, the next thing on my agenda was to go to the Mamertine Prison. Now, the Mamertine Prison is a, a couple mile walk uh, from St. Peter's Cathedral. And in fact, it's kind of hard to find the Mamertine Prison. Um, it's, it's down by the Roman Forum, not too far from the Colosseum. And you kind of go down this little side street. And when we went down the side stream, I wasn't quite sure uh, where the Mamertine Prison was. Uh, it's can't even hardly find it on your GPS. Um, and then I had to ask a couple people. And then once we got there, I said to somebody, is this the Mamertine Prison? And they're like, yep, this is the Mamertine Prison. And the Mamertine Prison is the place uh, where the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter uh, were in jail. And it's really the opposite of St. Peter's Cathedral. It's just, it's a cistern. Um, it's just a hole in the ground, literally, uh, that held water. Um, and how they would put the prisoners in there is they would lower them down uh, by a rope. And it's the place where uh, St. Peter and St. Paul uh, spent their last days, their last moments, before they were taken out and executed. So um, this time, I went up to the ticket counter. Um, there was no waiting, no lines, walked straight to the front, got a ticket, walked down some stairs, down into this dark uh, cistern, this place underground where Peter and Paul were. And I thought, isn't this interesting? that tens of thousands of people are queuing up to see this opulent, beautiful cathedral. And I could walk right to the front and go immediately to the place of the Mamertine prison. And I think this is really, even for us as Christians, this is the challenge for all of us, is that we want to experience the glory of the resurrection we're not so excited about the agony of defeat where Peter and Paul spent their last hours before they were executed. As we go through life, we're always looking for the good life, for the easy life, for the wonderful experiences, for the things that are exciting and new. But the reality is, if your life is anything like my life, much of life is not that exciting. It's not that glorious. It's not that wonderful. It's oftentimes mundane. It's difficult. It's hard. It's a struggle. And so today, I want to juxtapose this idea of uh, what's even called the theology of glory versus the theology of the cross. And if you've been around Faith Lutheran Church for a while, you know that we are people of the cross. We certainly celebrate the victory and the glory of Jesus conquering the grave. But the reality is, Jesus went to the cross. He had to die for us. And this is why it's so important for us to spend some time in the book of Lamentations this morning. The Bible is very, very honest about the human condition. See, we would love for the Bible to be all about cotton candy and it makes us feel good. And sometimes we read different passages in scripture that just, they, they, they pick us up. And maybe you came to worship this morning looking for a picker-upper. And that's great. That's awesome. That's wonderful. But at the same time, isn't it true that much of life is just not that good? It's, it's, we don't live in Instagram life. Most of life is hard. It's difficult. It's painful. And so this is one of the reasons why I think the book of Lamentations is so important for us to be reading and studying. Lots of writers in the Old Testament wrote about difficult things, laments, if you will. Uh, Job, Ecclesiastes, half of the Psalms really focus on laments or uh, lamentations. And here Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, has written this lament. Lament. 
He's lamenting, he's sad, he's grieving over the destruction of the temple, over the Babylonians coming and overrunning uh, the, God's people in Jerusalem. So if the, the book of Jeremiah, as we read a couple weeks ago and studied, is, is kind of the, the funeral service of what's going on in Jerusalem, then the book of Lamentation is really the songs or the music. It's five songs, five long songs, five dirges, if you will. If you've ever been to a church service or heard of some music that's just, oh, and it's just like, oh my goodness, this music is such a downer. That is the book of Lamentations, and it goes on and on and on. If you're to look up the word lamentation in the dictionary, it says it's, it's all about sorrow. It's all about grief. And so as we read through the book of Lamentations, it really is this expression of grief and sorrow and sadness. It's kind of like uh, singing the blues or a country western song. This is what's going on in the ancient times for the people as they're reading through and listening to this. And you might be sitting here this morning thinking, can't we read and study something a little bit happier? Something that can just pick me up a little bit more? Well, we can and we will. But this is one of the things I love about Scripture is just the honesty. When we lean into uh, the books that just cry out to God saying, God, my life is hard. My life is difficult. This is why we, like God's people and the ancients, they studied and read the book of Lamentations. Because, I mean, why do we listen to country western music? Because it, we connect with it. Because it speaks what's going on in our hearts. It's like, man, my wife left me. I lost my job. I drink too much. And, you know, I, I have no money, right? I mean, it's just, that's just a country western song. And this is what's going on in the book of Lamentations. It's just this sadness. Everything is really, really sad. And I think the reason why this is so important for us to lean into the book of Lamentations is because it invites us to be honest with God. Oftentimes when we come to church, we want to be, you know, not honest with God. We just want to be happy and, and, and feel good. But the truth is, when we submit to God and say, God, everything's not okay in my life, there's brokenness, there's hurt. When we come before God, that in a place of, of honesty and just contrite hearts, acknowledging our sorrow, our grief, our brokenness, I think those are the places where God meets us. So let's pray as we uh, look at the book of Lamentations. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for your word, uh, even this word, God, this book that reminds us uh, that you are a God who is grieved over the broken condition of this world. And so, Lord, as we enter into your story this morning and hear what you would have to say to us uh, 2,500 years later, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable. For you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, let me give you a little bit of context for the book of Lamentations. I did this last week as well. So I want everybody to just go ahead and put up your hand. Please play along. This is the, the play along part. This is the context uh, for the book of Lamentations. So your pinky finger is 2000 BC. Ring finger is 1500 BC. Uh, your middle finger is uh, 1000 BC. And then uh, your pointer finger is... Uh, 500 BC. 2000 BC, uh, the major person coming, uh, this is the Old Testament review here, M a major character 2000 BC is Abraham. Very good. And this is really about the covenant promise. God comes to Abraham, 2000 BC. Uh, fast forward 500 years. The next major character of the Bible that we get to in the Old Testament is Moses. Excellent. You guys were listening last week. And so if this is about covenant relationship, this is about God's rescue uh, through Moses and uh, taking the people out of Egypt. 1000 BC, we get to King David. Awesome. Yeah. And this is all about the kingdom. So uh, covenant, rescue, and kingdom. And this is the, uh, the pinnacle of God's people, uh, the Israelites, in terms of it was the glory days. It was the zenith of power, of uh, privilege, of, of uh, it, was, it was the best time ever. And then we get to 500 BC, 
And this is all about the prophets. And this is where we've been the past couple of weeks. We're now 500 BC, um, and we've looked at several prophets. We've looked at Ezekiel. Um, we've looked at some of the minor prophets like Hosea, and, and uh, we're getting to Ezra. But it's all those prophets, and this is about exile. So for it's about covenant, uh, rescue, kingdom. Now we are in a place of exile. Things are really, really bad. And we're, this is where we're going, folks. This is where we're going uh, as we get to the New Testament. So it's the very end of the Old Testament and all that's going on. So what is about the worst of times uh, for the Israelites? Uh, in 722, the Assyrians came in uh, and overran. Uh, the northern kingdom hauled them back to Assyria. Then in 586, the Babylonians came uh, three different times, conquered the southern kingdom of Judah, took them back to Babylon. And everybody is like, oh my goodness, things have completely fallen apart. Things are really horrible for God's people, the Israelites. And, uh, and and, and so they're expressing this grief that once upon a time we were a great nation under King David. Then soon we split and then things just fell apart. Now we're in exile. And uh, the, in the Old Testament, uh, uh, in ancient times, they had a book called the Talmud. And it was really the oral uh, sayings of uh, God's people. And one of the oral sayings went like this, that Israel is the center of the world. And Jerusalem is the center of Israel, and the temple is the center of Jerusalem. In other words, the temple was the center of the world. And at this point in time, in 586, the, the, the Babylonians have overrun the temple. They've burned it to the ground. And so now all of a sudden they're like, now what do we do? Things have fallen completely apart, and they're sad, and they're grieving, Everything has been destroyed, and they're in this place of deep sorrow. So Lamentations 1 begins like this. Jerusalem, once so full of people, is now deserted. She who was once great among the nations now sits alone like a wi widow. Once the queen of all the earth, she is now a slave. She sobs through the night. Tears stream down her cheeks. Among all her lovers, there is no one left to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her and become her enemies. Judah has been led away into captivity, oppressed with cruel slavery. She lives among foreign nations and has no place to rest. Her enemies have chased her down and she has nowhere to turn. The roads of Jerusalem are in mourning, for crowds no longer come to celebrate the festivals. The, gate, uh, the city gates are silent, her priests groan, her young women are crying. How bitter is her fate. Her oppressors have become her masters, and her enemies prospers, prosper. For the Lord has punished Jerusalem for her many sins. Her children have been captured and taken away to distant lands. All the majesty of beautiful Jerusalem has been stripped away. Her princes are like starving deer searching for pasture. They are too weak to run from the pursuing enemy. And so things are really, really bad. And the prophet Jeremiah, who wrote the book of Lamentations, he's expressing, he's just pouring out to God his grief, and he's using some images and some metaphors to really explain how sad he is. He says, you know, once we were this great nation, and now we're just nothing. Our city is an absolute rubble. Now, what you need to know is, like I said, when the Babylonians came, uh, and they, they sieged the city for a while, and then they overran it. But the final day, Scripture tells us uh, that the temple was torn down and burned to the ground uh, in 586. It's the ninth in the Hebrew month, the ninth day in the Hebrew month of Av. The ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av. And so it becomes this day uh, that, that they commemorate. And here we are 2,500 years later, plus Jewish people today still celebrate or commemorate as a better way of saying it, the ninth of Av, this day in which everything in their lives fell apart. And uh, the day, it's actually called the, the Tisha B'Av, the Tisha B'Av, it literally means the day of mourning. And they continue to commemorate this day because it was such a horrible day, the day when the temple was completely taken down and destroyed. Now, f fast forward 500 years. At this point in time, 500 years later, it's about 10 B.C., 
King Herod uh, rebuilds the temple. So now there's a second temple on the Temple Mount. And people are trying to figure out what it means. And this is the second temple in the New Testament, when we get to the New Testament, when Jesus and the disciples and all that's going on, that's actually the second temple that we're going to read about over and over and over. And it was built under King Herod, and it was completed in, in about 10 BC, so just before Jesus came on the scene. But as many of you know, as you know your church history or your history history or your Israeli history, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So the second temple was only up for about 80-ish years. 70 AD, it came in. This time, the second temple was destroyed by the Romans. They came in and they burned it to the ground. And here's the crazy thing. Do you know what day the, t the second temple burned to the ground, second, second time around? The ninth of Av. The exact day that the first temple burned to the ground. And so for the Jewish people, not only did the first temple uh, burn to the ground on the ninth of Av, but then also the second temple burned to the ground on the ninth of Av. One other thing you need to know about when you read history, uh, uh, Hebrew is that they always explain or describe their days, day first, then month. So we do month, then day. So September 1st is today. They would say the 1st of September. And since Av is the 11th month on their calendar, they would describe the 9th of Av as 9-11. See, as Americans, when I say 9-11, we think of two towers that fell to the ground. When a Jewish person hears 9-11, they think of two temples that were burned to the ground. It's powerful imagery, folks. This is what's going on. And the people are sad and they're grieving because they know that their temple has been burned to the ground and we've got the, 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 the privilege of looking in, in history in hindsight 2,500 years ago and then about 2,000 years ago on the 9th of Av, the temple burned to the ground. And of course they're sad. Everything is gone. Everything has been taken away from them. Verse 7. In the midst of her sadness and wandering, Jerusalem remembers her ancient splendor. But now she has fallen to her enemy and there was no one to help her. Her enemy struck her down and laughed as she fell. Jerusalem has sinned greatly, so she has been tossed away like a filthy rag. All who once honored her now despise her, for they have seen her stripped naked and humiliated. All she can do is groan and hide her face. She defiled herself with immorality and gave no thought to her future. Now she lies in the gutter with no one to lift her out. Lord, see my misery, she cries. The enemy has triumphed. The enemy has plundered her completely, taking every precious thing she owns. She has seen foreigners violate her sacred temple. Remember, it's now the Babylonians in the city, and they're in, wandering around the sacred temple, the place the Lord has forbidden them to enter. And can you hear what's going on here? They're, they're, uh, Jeremiah is grieving over the temple and the sadness of the temple. It's gone. And I think it's really interesting that many people uh, have, have placed their trust, they've placed their hope in a building, in a temple. You think about this, 2,000 years ago, as people see this building where they met God, this temple, all of a sudden it's gone and they don't quite know what to do with themselves. I mean, I, I see this parallel for how we, many people live their lives today. Many people, they go to a building and think but just by showing up to the building every now and then that they're going to be safe. That just by showing up to church on Sunday morning every now and then, everything's going to be good in their lives. See, they place so much emphasis and focus on a building, a place that they've neglected the relationship with the living God. That's what's going on uh, with the folks who lived in Jerusalem too much focus on a building and not enough focus and emphasis on a relationship with God. And, and as we've been talking about finding a building, 
Looking for a building. I just want to remind us all that a, a building is not an endpoint. A, a building is not what, what was ultimately the goal. A building is simply a tool for ministry. And so as we're looking for a building, we're seeking a place where we can gather together, not to feel safe, but so that we can welcome others into a living relationship with God. And we can't ever lose our focus as God's people, the Israelites, lost their focus. Because once they had a building, the temple, they're like, ah, we're just going to sit back and God's going to take care of us. Folks, we can't do that. We have to continue to be missional. We have to continue to be leaning forward. The discipleship is not about a building. Discipleship is always about a relationship. We see this in the New Testament even. This is, this is common. Remember the day in John 4 where Jesus is having a conversation with the woman at the well? And they're talking back and forth, and, and pretty soon things get a little bit tense for the woman. And uh, he, he, he asks her about her faith. And what does she say? She says, our fathers worshipped on this mountain. She immediately goes to the place of where they worshiped. Jesus asked about her relationship with God. And she's like, nah, I'm just going to talk about church. Have you ever talked to someone about their faith and said, hey, how are you doing in your faith? And they immediately start talking about a building, a place to go. Those are two different things. And so we got to be careful over and over and over. Jesus says, no, I'm not talking about a building. I'm not talking about, you know, the, the mountains on which your ancient fathers worshipped. I'm talking about having a relationship with the living God. And so we're going to continue to lean into a relationship with the living God. But it, right now, they're grieving. They are lamenting over the place uh, that is gone. Verse 11. Uh, the lament continues, folks. Don't get too excited here. Her people groan as they search for bread. They have sold their treasures for food to stay alive. Oh, Lord, look, she mourns, and see how I am despised. Does it mean nothing to you, all who pass by? Look around and see if there is any suffering uh, like mine, which the Lord brought on me when he erupted in fierce anger. He has sent fire from heaven that burns in my bones. He has placed a trap in my path and turned me back. He has left me devastated, racked with sickness all day long. He wove my sins into uh, ropes and hitched me to a yoke of captivity. I mean, the language is really colorful here, right? If you've ever been just depressed, you're like, ah, oh, God, I'm angry, I'm mad, whatever. Oh, no, Jeremiah gives it to us straight uh, in, in the book of Lamentations. Uh, he wove my sins into ropes and hit to hitch me to a yoke of captivity. The Lord sapped my strength and turned me over to my enemies. I am helpless in their hands. The Lord has treated my mighty men with contempt. At his command, a great army has come to crush my young warriors. The Lord has trampled his beloved city like grapes are trampled in a wine press. For all these things, I weep. Tears flow down my cheeks. No one is here to comfort me. Any who might encourage me are far away. My children have no future, for the enemy has conquered us. Jerusalem reaches out to help, but no one comfort, comforts her. Regarding his people Israel, the Lord said, Let their neighbors be their enemies. Let them be thrown away like a filthy rag. Jeremiah is mad. He's sad. He's grieving. He's pouring out his heart to God. It, it does it. He does, he's not excited about this. He feels really, really broken hearted that Jerusalem has fallen. And so he cries out to God and says, God, I am so sad that Jerusalem has fallen, that the temple has been overrun. And sometimes people will look at this passage and they'll say, well, there's Jesus in the Old Testament. Jesus, and, and even the, the, in the New Testament, by the time we get to the New Testament, people saw Jeremiah and Jesus. One day, one day, Jesus and the disciples were up near Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus looked at his disciples and said, hey, who do people say I am? And they're like, well, some say you're like John the Baptist or uh, Isaiah or Jeremiah. And then, of course, Peter, you know, does his famous proclamation. But people saw the parallel between Jesus and Jeremiah. 
Because Jeremiah, of course, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, he was known as the weeping prophet, the guy who is sad. And what's going on here in the book of Lamentations is people are seeing this, the, the weeping of Jeremiah over what's going on. And it reminds me of uh, Matthew 23, where towards the end of his life, Jesus is walking along with his disciples. They're on the Mount of Olives. And he's getting ready to be uh, arrested and go off to the cross. And Jesus speaks these words, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often have I wanted to gather you together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you would not let me. And now look, your, the, your, your house is abandoned and desolate. Jesus speaks these words of lamentation over Jerusalem. He acknowledges that God's pe Jesus has come for the Jewish people, for God's people, and they've rejected him. And Jesus is so sad. It, does him no, it make, gives him no pleasure the ways in which God's people have rejected him, much like the ways in which God's people uh, rejected the words of Jeremiah. Verse 18. The Lord is right, Jerusalem says, for I rebelled against him. Listen, people everywhere. Look upon my anguish and despair, for my sons and daughters have been taken captive to distant lands. I begged my allies for help, but they betrayed me. My priests and leaders starved to death this in the city. Even as they search for food to save their lives, Lord, see my anguish. My heart is broken and my soul despairs, for I have rebelled against you in the streets. The sword kills, and at home there is only death. Others heard my groans, but no one to turn, turn to me for comfort. When my enemies heard about my troubles, they were happy to see what you had done. Oh, bring the day you promised when they will suffer as I have suffered." Look at all their evil deeds, Lord. Punish them as you have punished me for all my sins. My groans are many, and I am sick at heart. And so what Jeremiah is saying in this last verse of uh, Lamentations is that, God, you have punished me because all of my sins. At this point in time, Jeremiah is acknowledging that the reason why he and God's people have experienced uh, the, the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, is because of their sins. You know, if you ever look at uh, revivals uh, in the life of the church throughout history, often one of the main ingredients early on is this mourning over sin. It's this acknowledgement that the people have been sinful and they're grieving over their sin. In fact, it may be the very first step in revival, in spiritual revival, to just have this honest look at my life and say, God, I am a sinner. See, when we, when we think about this whole idea of sin, there are a couple different ways that people deal with sin. Perhaps the most common way that people deal with sin is just to deny it or ignore it. They look at their lives and they're like, nah, I'm not so bad. Right? I'm not, I'm not really that bad of a sinner. Or, ah, eh, so what? Does it really matter? We, I think so many of us spend our lives in denial of, the, of, of what sin is in our lives, the, the devastation of sin in our lives, and the consequences of sin in our lives. So people oftentimes tonight, the second thing uh, people do with uh, sin in their lives is that they compare themselves. Yeah, I'm a sinner, but man, my fraternity brothers, woo, they were really sinners. Yeah, I'm really a sinner, but my coworkers, yeah, I'm really a sinner, but uh, Jim Pitzer there, whoa, he calls himself the, the king of all sinners, right, Jim? Yeah, close enough, okay. <laughs> we compare ourselves to others, right? We look around, we, 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 we minimize our sin. So we deny our sin, we compare ourselves uh, to others, and we think our sin isn't as bad as their sin. The third thing that people do with their sin is, is they look at their sin, they're like, okay, I got a sin problem, that's wrong, and then they try and deal with it themselves. And this is kind of the whole idea of karma and, and behavioral uh, fixing of our sin. So even though I've done really bad things in my life, I'm going to do some good things to outweigh the bad things. <laughs> 
And we see this over and over, and I see this in the church, frankly, is oftentimes people are motivated uh, to help others because they feel guilty. They feel shamed of the sinful things they've done. And so people deny their sin, they compare their others uh, to others with their sin, and then they try and do their own, I'll just call it sin management. But then the fourth way, which I would call uh, is the biblical way in, t- in terms of dealing with sin, is acknowledging our sin, looking at ourselves and just saying, yep, I'm a sinner. And just acknowledging it. And rather than trying to compare ourselves to others or try and fix it to ourselves, we just bring it to the cross. Just bring it to Jesus. Say, I, I, I can't fix this. This is too much for me. This is the biblical way that God is inviting us in the Old Testament and the New Testament to deal with our sin, acknowledge it, to own it, to just say, ah, this, this is mine. And God, I need you to wash me. I need you to cleanse me uh, from my sin. Because if we don't own our sin and invite God to do something with our sin, we can't do anything with our sin. We stay dirty. So there was a time in our nation uh, where the bathtub, believe it or not, was considered a luxury item. And so in the 19th century, uh, there were actually laws against this uh, luxurious item uh, that certain states and certain cities put into practice that, you know, there were taxes on it, and it was really looked down on. It was frowned upon if people bathed too much. Uh, And I ran across an interesting story here in 1842, in Boston, uh, it was because it was considered luxurious vanity, uh, it was unlawful to take a bath without a doctor's prescription. You couldn't do that in Boston uh, in 1842. In 1843, uh, the city of Philadelphia, they put a law in place because they thought the bathtub was so horrible um, that you were forbidden to take a bath between November 1st and March 15th. I mean, talk about a stinky winter, right? But for me, I see this all the time. Some people would rather sit in their stench than take a bath. Invite God's word, the presence of Jesus Christ to just wash over them. And so I just want to give you that imagery If you don't fess up, you won't be cleaned up. But when you fess up, God promises that he will clean us up through his word, through the person of Jesus Christ. So I just want to close um, by just kind of coming back and pulling this all together, this idea of living into the book of Lamentations and why it's so important. And I want to remind you that 50% of the book of Psalms, we've read through most of them, there are songs of lament. It's this, this opportunity to come clean before God, to acknowledge our brokenness, to acknowledge our sinfulness, to cry out to God and say, God, I can't do this. I can't clean myself up. In fact, uh, King Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes says this, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. Let me translate that for you. Sometimes it's better if you need a cleansing of your soul, if you need God's help in your life, if you need rest, if you need cleansing, if you need to be healed. Instead of going on a cruise to feel better, take a walk in a cemetery. I've never had anybody come back from a cruise, a vacation, and say to me, man, I just met God on that cruise. But I've had many people share with me as they've spent time in a cemetery or a funeral of how that invited them to get real with God and to think about their own lives. About 25 years ago, when I first got into youth ministry in Hopkins, Minnesota, uh, I did junior high confirmation. And at the end of junior high confirmation with the kids, uh, we would pile all the kids into a couple church vans. We would drive 16 hours west out to the Rocky Mountains near Billings, Montana. Uh, 
The kids would get out of the church vans. We'd spend uh, about five days at about 13,000 feet in altitude, backpacks, camp food, hiking around in the mountains, uh, relationship building, Bible study, all that good stuff. At the end of the week, we'd pile back into the church vans. We'd drive uh, 16 hours back to uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. But before we arrived back, about four hours out, I always had one more stop for the kids. We pulled into a cemetery. And I, the kids would get out of the vans and they're like, what are we doing in a cemetery? And I would say, kids, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get out of the, uh, go out, spread out. This, these are junior high kids. This was a hard assignment. Spread out and just find yourself a quiet place. And I want you to have a quiet conversation with God. No talking for the next 30 minutes and just see what God says to you. I tell you what, after 30 minutes, those kids would get back in the van and we had some of the most profound conversations for the rest of the way back to Hopkins, Minnesota. Because those gravestones were crying out to those kids. They were reminding their, those kids that their lives were finite. What those gravestones were saying to those kids is, I'm coming for you. Your days on this life, are, uh, on this earth are short. Make sure you take care of the days. And it was this honest assessment for these junior high kids coming into high school. This reminder that life is not all happy, but there's a real sobering aspect about life. This is what the book of Lamentations is about. It's about getting real with God. And I think when we get real with God and we acknowledge the hardship, the difficulty with God, he meets us in those places. He comforts us in those places. And he gives us clarity about why we're here, why we're on this earth. And guess what? We're not here very long. We are here for just a short time. And so I think the gift of the book of Lamentations is this reminder to be real with God and to live our lives with meaning and purpose. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, that you are indeed a God who comes to us and meets us in all seasons, not just when times are good, Lord, but certainly when times are hard and difficult. And so God, thank you. Thank you for the prophet Jeremiah. Thank you for the words of lamentations that remind us, God, that you meet us in our hurt. You meet us in our pain. You meet us in our struggle. So come, Lord Jesus, allow us to be real with you. Allow us to confess our brokenness to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.